market. And um, I, I also love what I do or I wouldn't be doing it this long. Um, but but that's kind of my background. Um, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Or, or if you want me to jump into something, you let me know. All right. Thank you. So tonight I'm going to quote unquote teach to the book, but not really because all of the knowledge that I spew within 30 to 45 minutes speaking to a client on the phone was the reason why I wrote the book because it was I felt like I was repeating myself over and over again. And I was just like between my family not having enough time of mine and my clients, I had to find a happy medium to where I was giving them what they deserved while also giving my family the time that they also deserved. And so the only part of this book that I'll really stick to the script on is the timeline. And so just trying to understand life in general, I came across this timeline of who and how um, America society came to be. And so this timeline starts in 1789, private property rights. The United States government rules that Blacks are slaves in property and not citizens, and they have no rights. In 1855, Massachusetts passed its Married Woman's Property Act on May 5th, allowing white married women the ability to buy, sell, and manage real property property and personal property. This also include the individuals that she owned or her husband owned at one time. Uh, Congress charted the Freedmen Savings and Trusts. This was in 1865, the banking institution for those released from slavery. But one of the things that they don't talk about was that bank was raided and all of that money gone. So, and I think it was to the tune of like one point six billion dollars if they would have put it to like today's equivalency of the bank and so if all of us had all of our money in the bank today it would be 1.2 billion dollars that was just lost and that was like investment or savings or for a house or whatever it was for uh, in 1866, the Fourteenth Amendment declared that all persons born in the United States are citizens and have the same right to real property. 1876, the government can take your land. This is known as eminent domain, and it's for the greater good. And so, typically, eminent domain only takes place when, let's say, for instance, like there's a Walmart coming, and it's for the greater good of community. And this is when community comes out and says. Uh, we're not having it. Do you have standing? Sometimes, but there have been many a community or neighborhoods that have been uh, turned, like broken down, sold out, sold a Walmart. So a um, Maunea Cass, for those who don't know, was about to be a highway. And she fought tooth and nail to make sure that the highway did not go through Dorchester, Roxbury, chest not chestnut hill uh brighton area and that's why the highway goes around and then we have 90 that was monea cast and so for those who did not know now you know on 1916 buchanan versus worley the court found it unconstitutional for the louisville kentucky ordinance that prohibited blacks from purchasing a property in a white majority owned neighborhood and this was like 1918 <laughs> Yet, uh, 1917 Supreme Court ruled based on race was unconstitu unconstitutional and they could not have covenants or restrictions. There are still properties today in Brighton and Brookline that if sold, would their, their covenants would still read so. Um, from the research that I did, they have not been sold and the families do not plan on selling them because they will forever be in the family. Um, 1924 National Association of Real Estates was a huge part of the lack of integration within neighborhoods. It was part of their policy that real estate agents could not, should never be instrumental in the introduction into a neighborhood, a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality or any individuals whose presence will be detrimental to the property values in that neighborhood. 
Um, Home Owners Loan Corporation, uh, created by Franklin D. Roosevelt, was part of the New Deal. 1934, Federal Housing Administration was established. 1934, the U.S. government creates redlining through the National Housing Act of 1934, allowing Home Owners Loan Corporation to create residential security maps. And we know this today to be redlining and why communities are fundamentally how they are. Um, and th these maps outline high risk areas where mostly uh, people of color occupied. And this is predominantly the reason why Blacks live in isolated areas of urban cities today. 1936, the FHA promotes racial segregation. The prohibition of the occupancy of properties except by the race in which they were intended. And so a lot of the things that we see today and how the FHA is currently structured has a lot to do with how they were formally structured and trying to make amends for the behavior that they not only condoned, promoted, but ultimately established. Uh, 1944, the GI Bill or Servicemen's Readjustment Act afforded 63,000 white veterans home ownership opportunities while non-whites were less than 100. Through my research, I learned that those less than 100 lied on their application and they didn't have social media like we did today. Like you can't just type in Taylor Andre and know she was like a black woman from Boston. And so if your name was Tom Smith and you put on your application that you were white, if you take a look at the, the movie, The Banker, that really played, um, that really broke down a lot of what I've read as far as history was concerned. And it's a good movie. Um, blockbusting, real estate agents deceiving people into white flight. Blacks are moving in. It's time to move. 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Uh, 1968, Pre President Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1968. Um which was the Fair Housing Act. That's what we know it as. All that little writing that you see when you apply for an apartment or you apply um, for like moderate to low income, the, all that small print breaks down the Fair Housing Act that prohibits discrimination, sale, rental, financing of housing based on race, religion, national origin. It was later amended to include disabilities and family status. Um <clears throat> In 1973, Donald Trump and his daddy were sued for racial discrimination. In 1974, the Fair Housing Act was amended to include sex. In 1974, credit, uh, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, creditors can be discriminatory based on race regarding loans. 1977 was the Community Reinvestment Act or Housing and Community Development Act of 1977, which talked about loan practices and the transparency. And I will uh, stop here to give Brian a moment to speak a little bit more about that, because I know it from a... Um, like reading it. I don't know it from experience and actually being um, in the business. And so what transparency of loan, like what part of the loan practices were they trying to be transparent about? Uh, with, with, in related to CRA, the Correct. Community Reinvestment Act. Mm -hmm. So that really was established more that, uh, Banks doing business in particular areas have to invest in those areas. Um, prior to that, you know, any bank, um, you know, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just throwing it out there. But there's a Bank of America everywhere, right? Prior to that, Bank of America could lend money in communities and not invest in them. And so the I think that can kind of be confusing because when we're consumers, we we think, okay, we're receiving money, so they're doing something good for us. The reality is we're paying them back with interest, right? Mm -hmm. So they're making money, you're not in that transaction. You, you're getting money to do something maybe you want to do, whether it's a business or a home or whatnot, but you're not necessarily benefiting from that in that transaction. Um, the Community Reinvestment Act forces banks doing business in those areas to invest in them, meaning um, take deposits, um, invest in, in low-income housing, um, invest in education, 
in every aspect. They, so every year, um, and this only goes for banks, you know, it doesn't actually apply to um, probably 90 plus percent of mortgage lenders because mortgage lenders are not banks. Um, mm -hmm. It really only applies to banks. Um, so there's there's all kinds of things that banks can do to um, to check the box per se when they get audited every year. Um, whether it be um, literally actually just um, handing over checks and investing in housing authorities, um, which is clear cut, like that that checks the box. Um, they can also offer certain programs, loan programs for low income. Um, and that's all based on uh, uh, county average median income. That's that's how the CRA is kind of developed. But um, it's really just about investing in the same communities that you're lending in mm -hmm. um, because the lending benefits the bank. The, the reinvestment in the community is, like I said, for schools, for education, for uh, low-income housing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1980, Bill Dedham invested, investigated that banks would lend to lower-income whites, but not middle or higher-income Blacks. 1988, the National Fair Housing Alliance was founded. And in 1988, the Fair Housing Act amended to include family status. In 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023, we have seen J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, all within the last 10 years, were instructed to pay hundreds of millions of dollars for still today discriminatory practices that they engage in. So even though this book start, like the timeline started all the way in what was it, 18... 1789, we still, many years later in 2023, are seeing the effects of how this plays out. And I, the reason why the timeline is so important for me is because I was having too many conversations with people that felt like they were failures, too many conversations with people who felt like, you know, maybe this isn't for me. And, and this part of the book for me is like, this is not a hundred percent on you. And so, yes, do you have to take accountability for how you spend your finances, how you budget your finances? Absolutely. But at the same time, you have to also understand the history that brought you to where you are today and why your family may be like the third generation having section eight. So I just, I wanted to kind of relieve people of that stress of not feeling like they are enough um, and that there's something that they did wrong to be in the position that they're in. So with that being said, um, how do I buy a house and what is the process in which I have to go through? And so first and foremost, um, it's for me, it's mindset. And the reason why I say mindset is because I had a client that had $35,000 income. That's all she made was $35,000. Bank of America is one of those banks that do very much so do all types of messery. And then when they get a slap on the wrist, they're like, hold on, we have this money that we're trying to give. She tapped into that grant program, $35,000 a year. Brian, uh, typically what kind of pre-approval for a three family would that yield you with, with great credit, no yeah. debt to income? Um, with, with no other debt, Three family. I mean, with today's okay, interest rates, rates with uh three point five. Let's see. Okay, I was gonna <laughs> say today's rates. Um, <laughs> uh, probably I would guess somewhere around four hundred. It was three sixty five. She was oh. pre approved for three sixty five, yeah. and this was in two thousand and eighteen, and she ended up purchasing a three family in Taunton that needed work. Her husband was electrician, and when I say husband, I mean they've been together twenty years, but they're not married. Um, was electrician. He did all the electrical work because he's in the field. He found a whole bunch of friends, cousins, somebody that can come and help. Uh, that was in 2017. The house has more than doubled in equity since then. And they still have not done like the complete renovation of each floor. And so I say that to say mindset is really important. And 
if you have to know how much money you're making, how much do you have in savings, even though there's grants galore in the state of Massachusetts and Rhode Island, you still have to be mindful of what your debt to income looks like and <clears throat> know that you may need to leave. I have clients that have purchased in Gardner. I didn't even know where Gardner was before we went to Gardner to look at the house that they currently live in. Um, but it's a beautiful neighborhood. And this is well before people were doing remote work and they travel 90 minutes a day to and from work. And so I say that to say like having a realistic mindset of what is this going to look like um, for you? And so after mindset, I want you to take a look at your savings. Um, I've had clients that was just like, you know, I have $1,000 saved. If you've never saved money, $1,000 saved feels like that. that is a tremendous feat, right? To get over that 999, that $1,000 is amazing. I had to be honest. That is unrealistic. That is unrealistic because your inspection alone is going to be $550. And that's to inspect the house to make sure that that home is up to par and isn't going to fall down while you're in it. Um, I tend to tell people, let's start off with $12,500. That's a, I feel like that's a really good number. It, it allows you to still be able to maybe cover your own costs depending on what you're purchasing, but I think that's a good starting point. And even like 10,000 is a good starting point. The reason why I say 10,000 is because let's say for instance, you do get a pre-approval for 350,000 on a condo that you still need that 10,000 for your 3.5% down and for your closing costs. Will you be able to tap into grant programs? Absolutely. But no matter what grant program exists, they require you to come to the table with your own 1.5%. And so if you don't come to the table with that 1.5%, whether it's a lottery home, whether it's a 40B, and a 40B is if you look at the back of a newspaper and it's just like, um, um, low to moderate income, uh, three bedroom, two bath with a garage home apply now. That was a developer that built in Wayland or Weymouth or uh, Newton. And part of the deal of them getting this fund, this these monies from the government, they had to incorporate one or more low to moderate income house. So even though other houses in that cul-de-sac or on that street or in that neighborhood are selling for 750000 825000 you were able to purchase this beautiful home in an amazing school district for three seventy-five, dollars And that's uh, the short version of what a 40B is. And so take a look at the back of the newspapers, which still very much advertise to those, even the um, uh, Yahida, the free one that comes out on Thursday, um, Boston Banner, even the Boston Banner, they still have some of the 40 Bs, which are also lottery. But when I tell you, uh, there have been four different lotteries and I like way out, one in Weymouth, one in Newton, one in, um, there was one in Gardler, one in Wayland. And it was just like, apply, like apply for this now. And I know everybody who got one of those homes because who's actively saying, I want to move to Wayland, not knowing that Wayland is number, like one of the top schools in Massachusetts. And so while you're attached to like, I want to be in the city, like go outside and go listen to the crickets. <laughs> You can have a yard, a great school system, and um, a backyard that you can entertain in. So savings is really important. Uh, anything north of 10000 is a good starting point. Anywhere south of 10000 and it, you may want to like incorporate whether or not um, like a, a completely different location. 
And what I mean by that is I do have clients that purchase in South Carolina where you can get a house for $135,000 and where, you know, $5,000 savings will be able to cover your closing cost um, and your down payment and you could still live comfortably. So it, going back to like mindset, um, where do you want to live? Where are you willing to accept? What do you want versus what do you know you can afford? And and having, like, I don't want you walking in thinking you're going to get a million dollar multifamily when you have a $550,000 pre-approval. And so just really managing expectations and sometimes where your goals aren't located, you aren't located where your goals are. And so it's okay. Um, my client that purchased in South Carolina is doing amazing and thriving and has purchased three other houses since then. Um, and that's not the end for her. She is stacking up all of these properties. She's all these doors. She's collecting all these doors so she can come back home and just rent those out. And so let's take that same mindset. Let's say, for instance, you get one of the affordable condos um, here in the city or one of the affordable condos that's being built in Attleboro and Taunton because um, Brockton is the new Boston. And then it's 30 miles outside of Brockton is where you start seeing the diminishing um, home prices. But in that same conversation, I'm looking at New Bedford, Fall River, uh, Pawtucket, and you can find multifamilies upwards to a million dollars after they've been renovated. Why? Because people are working remote and it doesn't matter where they live. Uh, they just want a house they can buy. And so the, you know, when it comes to supply and demand, the demand is so low the supply is so low and the demand is so high that people are willing to pay over asking just to get in something that looks decent. And so <clears throat> from there, I for you to understand the debt to income. So let's say, for instance, I have a credit card. I have $100 on that credit card. If I'm using $50 of that 100, I'm at 50% utilization. And what that says, and so I... I don't believe in speaking to adults like children, but I do believe like simplifying it to the smallest molecule so that we can all be on the same page. So if you feel like I'm dumbing things down, please forgive me. I just want us to all understand fully um, without complicating things. Let's say, for instance, we gave our kids $20. They said, mom, can we go to the store? They went to the store with $20. They came back with no money. But you have another kid you gave $20 to, came back with one or two things and still came back with $15. That happens three, four, five times. They come back, people are creatures of habit. They come back, mom, can I get $20? What kid are you most likely about to give some money to? The one that brings you back your change. <laughs> so... And that's the way that credit bureaus look at us. They look at us like those children. Are you going to bring me back my change? Are you going to govern yourself accordingly? Or are you going to max it out every time I give you some money? And so if you currently do have credit cards, you want to be mindful of your utilization. Do not swipe if you cannot deposit. That is my rule. You can swipe or no swipe all day. And this is when I add my own bit. I do not own a debit card. It's actually screwed me a couple of times, but um, clearly I didn't need what I wanted at that time. But having a, a debit card, you have no security. If you use a debit card and you lose that cash, you can't get that back. If you use a debit card and you purchase a product, unless you have a warranty on that product that you purchase, you have no protection on that product a service, a trip. But if you use a credit card and that long thing that they send you, you there's benefits in there for you. Even though it's a whole bunch of, we're going to charge you 26% of whatever you owe, there's also some things in there 
that protect you. For instance, many cards today have you have the ability to have insurance. You don't have to go to Enterprise and add insurance to your rental because your credit card covers it. Now, be mindful, not every credit card covers your rental coverage, uh, your rental um, insurance, but a lot of them do. Same thing with your phone. If you pay for your phone bill and purchased your phone with a credit card and your phone is stolen, you don't need insurance through Sprint and T-Mobile because your credit card protects you. I recently had an incident where I used my card uh, for a flight and my flight was canceled. That prohibited me from going to Georgia and conducting business. So not only did I get reimbursement for my entire flight, I also got, um, I'm a little excessive, so I'm not going to tell you all that I got because they, they mess with my business. So that was completely different. And I have a business card, which conducts itself a little bit different than a personal card. But I go for the gusto because I have the, I have the card that's going to allow me to go for the gusto. And so I'm like uppercut, jab, jab, knockout, because what you're not going to do is mess with my money. And so for debit cards, I personally do not suggest ever using a debit card. Always use your credit card. But if you cannot pay what you are swiping, do not swipe. But if you can, it locks you and you can get gas points. So you cheaper gas. You can get points for travels. That's what I care about. And so everything goes towards me getting on a flight for free or staying at a, a night for free. Um, some other benefits that I can't think of because they're not important to me. Cash oh, back. restaurants. Yeah. You can get discounts at restaurants. Like there's just a long list of different discounts and benefits that you can use just using your credit card and all your purchases are secure and so brian i didn't mean to interrupt you is there anything you wanted to add oh no i i actually agree wholeheartedly i um i do have a debit card um i uh use it for absolutely nothing um i've always used credit cards um and and exact same kind of scenario not so much the insurance parts and everything but for me personally it was um I, I had an incident where i um i ran my debit card this was 10 plus years ago i ran my debit card at the store and it got declined and i knew there was a lot of money in that account so mm -hmm. i went out to my car panicking like i'm i must have just gotten fleeced and um i logged into my account and everything was fine but that panic itself made me feel like okay if i'm if something was to ever happen let the credit card company chase their money you mm -hmm. know if something happens to your debit card and you lose it or someone steals it or hacks you your money's gone mm -hmm. now you're you're waiting on your money um credit card gets hacked the, the credit card company deals with it and to be honest with you their security is tenfold over a, a bank debit card as far as I'm sure you've experienced this too, where they call you, they say, Hey, did you do this purchase? And you're like, that's crazy. They even caught that. Um, so it, it's always better to use a credit card, not only for security, but, but also building credit. A debit card is never going to build your credit. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good, um, it's a good characteristic to be against using credit in general but if you're using it as a debit card that means you have the money to pay it mm -hmm. um and that so use it like it's a debit card i guess would be the mindset you have to have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i do want to stop there because i feel like there was there was a lot of information given and i want to make sure no one has any questions before we move on to like the sides no, we're good to go. Okay. So we have our credit and I'm going to just pretend like everyone has their credit in order because this is not a credit class. This is a home buying class. And if you do need help with credit, I can direct you to people who can help you. Um, something that I do not publicize, but I, many of us, 
I have cousins, I have aunties that do not have credit cards. They don't even like the bank. Everything they have is in a coffee can, under the bed, in the garage, in the corner, like real life. Never had any type of banking establishment. And then when you go back into the book and you, you remember that all these people had their money in the bank and then they were like, oh, we don't know where your money is. Ha ha ha. You'll never get it. One point two billion dollars lost. I understand why there's a hesitancy there. But when you are looking to purchase a house, you do want to have some type of established credit. Um, I have helped several people establish credit that previously did not have any at 40 years old, never had a bank account, never had a credit card. All of a sudden you're trying to buy a house. It does make it a little difficult and you're now looking at possibly having a co-signer. And so to alleviate that, if you, if you know that you're looking to purchase next year, let's go ahead, throw you on a trade line. It does not have to be Taylor's because I'm expensive. I charge $500 for three months. You can have a family member, but I have 800 credit score, 17 years, over $75,000 worth of utilization that can be tapped into at a 2% utilization. So um, I use 2%. I have access to to over 75,000. And I charge for that. But you might have a family member that has 725 credit score, 680 credit score. If you have a zero or 300 or 425, that could help you boost your credit score because now your profile is mirroring their profile. It doesn't mean you have access to their credit. Technically, you could if they gave you the credit card. I do not. It comes to my house. I cut it up. You never see it. Um, but your credit profile now looks like you have access to $75,000. It's You've had a credit profile for 17 years. Um that's great for when trying to get a credit card because the loans are a little smarter than that to the banks are like, mm, you're clearly on someone's straight line. This ain't you. And so I typically do that, or you can do that same thing. If you want to throw a child on your credit, I threw my, he's now 20. I threw Anari and Asaria on my credit cards when they turned 17, that whole year, they were able to, you know, mirror my profile. And when they turned 18 years old, Anari had a seven, it's, he loves this. I had a 777. And so we're lucky numbers, right? And so you can do that if you have a family member or a friend that can add you to their credit, but you also have to trust them because you're giving them access to your social security number, your birthday I would say your address, but they're not giving you the card or I don't suggest them giving you the card. And then once you have that profile, a good 45 days later, that's when you get a Capital One. You might get a $250 card. You use it every time you get gas. You pay it off like we just discussed, like it's a debit card. You do that for a couple of months and then they'll be like, hey, I see you're doing really well. Let me give you this increase. Your 250 now goes to 500. Then you go out and you get maybe another card that's like an ally card or a chase card or an express card, a Victoria's Secret card, a Macy's card, and you use it pay it off, use it, pay it off. And you prove yourself to be that child that can go to the store and come back with change. And once you do that, you are, you have your own established credit. You are removed off of either mine or somebody else's profile because you were able to set up a profile for yourself. This now gives you access to lower interest rates. If you're looking to get a car, which I do not suggest you do, because if you lease a car, you finance a car, you, unless you purchase outright, you now have a debt to income ratio that you previously did not have. I throw that out there because people are like, oh, now that I got credit, I can get a car. No, <laughs> because that $400 note that you now have is $400 less that you have to play with when you're looking to purchase your home. And so I will stop here and let Brian speak to the importance of like that debt to income ratio. And what does that look like with um, student loans? What does that look like when you have children with student loans? What does that look like when you have uh, car loans or credit card defaults? 
Um, so I, I don't want to get too far into student loans because those might get kind of complicated, but um, but I will touch on it. Um, so your debt to income ratio is your monthly income gross before taxes um, and, and any withdrawals um, versus your monthly debt. So if you, for example, have that $400 a month uh, car payment, that's going to translate into almost $100,000 worth of buying power um, on a home. Um, because if, if you think about it, obviously a credit card has a much higher uh, interest rate and it also has a much quicker repayment and amortization. A 30-year a mortgage is spread out over 30 years. So um, borrowing about 100000 on your mortgage it's going to land somewhere around between four and 500. Um, so it does make a pretty big in, impact. Um, if you happen to go online and look at homes and, and see the difference of a hundred thousand dollar difference in homes, it's significant. Like what you can buy with that extra hundred thousand, um, versus a car payment. Um, as far as student loans, that's probably, the biggest hurdle right now um, that I'm seeing as far as um, first time home buyers, um, everybody has student loans. It seems like schools cost a fortune, um, won't get into the politics of that, but um, there, there's, um, there is a uh, way to usually to get those payments down. So that's something I do help people with as far as, um, repayment, income-based repayment. Um, and in a lot of cases right now, um, I'd say five out of 10 people um, are able to actually even get it to zero. Um, so their their income-based repayment is zero. Um, you know, in the past, I don't know that I would have suggested doing that um, because all you're doing is kind of kicking the can down the street. Um, but that isn't the case necessarily anymore with a lot of the things that are going on where uh, the longer you kind of delay these, the 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 better possibility that maybe some of these student loans can be forgiven in the future. Whereas back in the day, de deferring a student loan was really just kicking the can down the street. You were going to pay it back eventually. You might as well rip the bandaid off. But things have definitely changed and there are avenues that... Um, that, that I can help people with as far as getting that payment down or possibly even to zero. So, um, and if, the, if it's currently in deferment, it's, yep. it's considered 1%. So if you owe 50,000. Well, it, it, depending on the programs, cause there are some that only count as half a percent um, if it's deferred. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but if you can document that you, so to that point, um, if you have a loan that was deferred um, over, say, the last year and now repayments gone back into effect October uh, 1st, right? Um, if you had a loan deferred and you set up this program, you actually would be taking it out of deferment. So you wouldn't still be deferred technically, but by taking it out of that deferment and doing the income-based repayment, you're actually not in deferment on credit but your monthly payment zero. And if you can, it, you, you get a document, you can print it, it's all done online. Um, if it says it's income-based repayment is zero, we count zero. If it's just in deferment, then you're correct. It's either 1% or half a percent, depending on the program. Mm -hmm. And 50%, um, even half a percent of 50,000 is still $250 a month. Yep which goes back to what, like an additional $65,000 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that you could have in purchase power. Um, yeah. And that 65,000 is, is huge when you're looking at a house at 400,000 versus 335,000 like that. It really, it does a number on you. And so I, I, I really want us to understand that part um, as far as, our debt. And so that goes for all, all of our debt, whether it's a credit card, whether it's a student loan or whether it's a personal loan that you took out or even a car loan. Um, one thing that I would love for you to know is that if you have less than 12 payments left on your car, they can 
depending on your your credit profile. And this is an, an amazing thing about credit. Now, if you on your credit, pay on time, always being so you're never late, you pay the full amount or you don't have any uh, deferments. If you are 12 months left of a car payment, they'll act like that car payment doesn't exist. But if your credit profile is like, yeah, you're kind of trash and there's no telling if you're going to run away from this car loan and all of a sudden it's going to default, you know, let's see how you do with the extra 12 months. And so that's one of the reasons why I think credit's so important that they don't even discuss with you or they don't like stress how important it is. Um, from there, we have we have your savings. You've got twelve thousand five hundred dollars in the bank. We know that we want to tap into some grants. Brian has them all, um, and your credit is strong. Typically, whatever you make per year, you multiply that by four. That is what your one family or your condo would be based for your pre-approval. So let's say, for instance, you make $100,000. You're looking at approximately $400,000 worth of a pre-approval. Let's say, for instance, you are at um, $100,000 and you want a two-family. There's a little bit more wiggle room there. You might get an extra twenty-five to thirty-five thousand on that pre-approval because you now have additional income coming in with that second unit. And so I'll let Brian break that down as far as what does that look like with a three-family, with a four-family. Anything above a four-family is considered commercial, and you won't be able to tap into like the FHA or the grants because um, five, four, five and above being commercial, that's more so on the investment side more than residential. Um, so just as far as multifamilies, so basically um, they will give you credit for whatever, if it's a two family, they give you credit for that additional unit. Um, and it's based off the appraiser's going to, when they appraise the home for the property value, they're also going to do uh, a rental schedule, which is going to um, give you a compar comparable rental um income for that area for that type of unit usually based off bedroom count etc um the 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 income that they come up with we're going to discount that 25 percent. so just for an example if you know the the market rent is two thousand dollars on that additional unit um they're going to give you credit for 1500 the 25 percent they kind of shave off the top is what they call um uh, vacancy so it's just assuming that at certain times you might be rotating tenants, whatever it is. So they discount that. Um, so they'd give you credit for 1500. So that 1500 is now considered part of your income. So that would afford you roughly another, um, figure about $130,000, hundred and thirty thousand dollars, hundred and $25,000 uh, buying power. So like all these things we keep talking about kind of help you just boost up what can you afford, um, whether it be because there's only two sides to that to that balance sheet, right? There's expenses that, that you have and then there's the income you have. But uh, multifamilies are a great way to um, not, not only get into the market, but it's also a great way to build wealth over the long run. Um, the, the hopes would be that you buy that to kind of help supplement your living expenses and um, possibly hold on to it and, and rent both units or all three units and, and move on from there one day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so just to understand the process of the, a pre-approval. So there's a big difference between a pre-approval and a pre-qualification. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time because we had it scheduled from six to seven. Is anyone opposed to going over to like a 715? I, I want to, I know we're all moms, parents, students, we got things to do. So I, I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. Ryan? I'm good. Okay. And so... 
there's a huge difference between a pre-approval and a pre-qualification. You can go online right now and get a pre-qualification. Is that does that mean that whatever that document says, you can go out into the world and purchase with? Absolutely not. And so a pre-qual or to pre-qualify you means that you inputted your um your yearly income. You inputted your savings. You inputted your uh credit score. And you inputted whether or not you want a single, a two, three, or four family. And based on that, they're giving you a guesstimate. Just like I said, if you make $100,000 a year, you could get a $400,000 pre-approval. That's not 100% true because if your credit utilization is at 65%, you're not, gonna, you're not getting that $400,000. You might get three twenty-five. dollars um, and so it's just a guesstimate. It's not real. When picking up the phone, talking to Brian, you are going to, and there's all women on here. It is a financial pap smear. It is the most invasive thing that you will ever experience. It is literally looking through your cash app, your Venmo, your bank account. It's going through everything that you have ever financially touched, all of your credit cards, every single one of your bank accounts, all of the accounts that the kids have, anything that's in default, things that you went ahead and paid someone $125 to take off your credit that you thought was on your credit is still on your credit and Brian can see all of it. And so there's so much more to a pre-approval and it's scary. It's really scary. And it makes you look at how much money do you have coming in and how much money do you have going out? And sometimes those pre-approvals hurt your feelings. When you think that you make decent money, you have pretty good savings and you don't overspend on your credit, but you still got an 85,000 pre-approval. Like, it's disrespectful for someone to tell you that, but it really makes you take a hard look in the mirror as to like, what do I need to do differently in order to move forward? And that's not a fake number that I literally had an $85,000 pre-approval because of where I was financially at that time. And so I don't, I don't say that lightly. I, I, I lived it. Right. And so I'm just sharing you, sharing with you my experience. So the first thing you will do is give it all up, <laughs> all of your documents, all of your paperwork, all of your tax returns. And for us with side hustles, I want to be mindful that when we think we're doing this, this was my problem. This is the reason why I had an $85,000 pre-approval because I had so many side hustles at the time that I wrote everything off my gas my the service to my vehicle, eating out, everything on my credit card was a write-off and it looked like I made $20,000 a year. And because I made $20,000 a year on paper, knowing damn well, that's not how much I really made. That's not how much I, I didn't want to pay the taxes. If I, if I can be, we're family, right? I can be transparent. I had to pay $8,000 in taxes. Like when I did when I did my taxes the way I was supposed to do my taxes in order to purchase my house, I had to pay them folks. <laughs> it was, it was, I paid them eight thousand dollars. And yo, you remember um in Ghost when she was writing the check at the bank and she was like, <laughs> that was me. That was me putting the check in the mail for the IRS to tax me. It was hurtful, but I did it. I survived. I'm a survivor. And it, it really puts you in a different mindset as far as like, this is, this is real life. This is reality. You have to claim there is no getting around it. If you have that side hustle money, if you are, have your own business, if you're doing Lyft and Uber and you're deducting all of these things, every time you deduct a dollar, you're really deducting a dollar from your pre-approval. So I want you to be mindful of that and not just you, but share this information when people are like, yeah, I'm writing everything off. No. If you're trying to buy a house, go on and just pay what you owe. If you're not trying to buy a house, I am not advising you to do anything <laughs> to save your funds. <laughs> Um, after their financial pap smear, Brian will come back and say, Hey, 
looking over all your financials. You look great. Your credit looks great. Your savings looks great. The pre-approval is X amount of dollars. That is the top of your pre-approval. We now know how much how much house you can afford. I'm going to be honest with you. These houses in Gardner are absolutely gorgeous. If you can work remote, bring your ass out west. Do a Worcester. Do a Springfield. And you know what's crazy is you can get to New York in like an hour in Springfield. Like it's so it's so much easier to get to New York. We have this perception that leaving Boston, like you leaves, like you're leaving your culture, you're leaving yourself, you're leaving your people. And you're really like, you're really not for my, like my Latinos, like Latinos are everywhere. Black people are everywhere. You, you can get you some adobo down the street. I promise you, Gardner has adobo. You can get sofrito, like bomb Jamaican food outside of Boston. No, okay, not all. I, maybe not all, but there's a, a there's a lot. Um, not just Gardner uh, and Springfield, but New Bedford. So I'm not a fan of Fall River. Fall River feels like a trailer park to me, but I feel like New Bedford has more of a more of a like Brockton feel. Um, and what's crazy is remember when Revere was ghetto. Revere, people can barely afford to buy in Revere right now. Lawrence used to be where all the hood rats lived. Lawrence is unaffordable right now. Like Lawrence has million dollar properties that still need $200,000 worth of work. So <laughs> there's there's so much opportunity. I'm also licensed in Rhode Island. Rhode Island is gorgeous. Um, especially, there's a lot of single families by the sea, like living on the ocean, uh, Swansea. For some reason, Swansea has a lot of elders. So there's a lot of single families in Swansea that are coming up on the market because a lot of the elders are passing on. And I say that, um, and a, a lot of their houses need work, but let me tell you about my favorite product in the whole wide world is a 203K. So you know the ideology of buying the ugliest house on the street in the best neighborhood, you can get a 203K and purchase the ugliest house on the street and make it your dream home within your budget. And so that I, I've i done four 203Ks with my clients so far, and it is by far one of the most satisfying feelings. Like helping people purchase a house, that's Great. I love it. Great feeling. But having someone build out their dream home, that's a whole nother level and a whole nother vibe. And so I'm going to pass the baton to Brian so he can talk about um, some of the products that exist when it comes to being able to, to yes, nor in Dighton. Yes. Right there on lakes. Exactly. Um, but I, I will be quiet and pass it to Brian. So uh, speaking on rehabs, there, there is a lot of different products. 203K is probably the most typical, um, probably the easiest as well, um, where you're able to buy a single family, two family, three family, four family um, that either is in desperate need of work um, because banks won't lend on a property that's not 100% livable. doesn't have to be pretty, but but it does have to be 100% livable. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as far as rehab loans are concerned, you can use that to take a home that is completely not livable and make it livable. And the bank will give you the money to do that work. Or you could take a house that's completely livable but you don't like it and you want it to be something else um so you can use it for needs and wants um i i guess i'll uh i'll tell you a quick story about i've i've done hundreds of them however um one always is my favorite story um there was a girl working for the city this is probably eight years ago she was working for the city um there was a house in high park that uh was condemned there was a big fire there um it was completely destroyed full full house fire condemned um and the elderly person who owned the home passed away the heirs got it they were like what are we even going to do with this um 
And it turned, I, and this is a girl who could not afford more than, I think at the time it was maybe 200,000. And this wasn't that long ago. So a single family, 200,000, where is she going with that, right? Um, her father knew somebody at the city so she could at least see inside the property with a contractor. Went in there. Um, the contractor's like, listen, I can probably get this up and running for about 80 grand you know, at least get you into a house that, that you can live in. Um, she ended up making an offer for a hundred grand on this house that was condemned anyways. Um, got her for that, borrowed 80,000, rehabbed it. Once she was finished, the home was worth so much more money. She came back, borrowed another 50, finished it nice. Um, so she, at that point was about 230 in the house appraised for 650. I mean, and since then, she's taken that equity. She bought a place in New Hampshire that she rents out, goes there sometimes during the summer, bought another two family um, in Brockton. So, and this is a girl who I really, in my mind, were like, she's going to struggle. Like there's there's not going to be much that she's going to work with for 200,000, but that rehab not only got her the house, but it, 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 it built an immense wealth for her. So it was a, it was a huge success story. Hence why I go back to that versus, you know, somebody who buys a house and just redoes it. And yes, you're going to build equity, no question. But um, that was kind of a real feel good um, situation. And you can actually get multifamilies in New Hampshire for like $300,000 with like 16 acres of land. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and people lo like I I love New Hampshire I love going out um not just in the winter time for the mountains but even in the summer it's like I'm all about the crickets um <laughs> and so we have this pre-approval we're putting an offer on a house after you I'm going to tell you I recently closed with a client that had a eight hundred thousand dollar pre-approval single family, $800,000. Can I please tell you how long it took us to get an accepted offer? It It is brutal outside. It, winter is coming. No, winter is here and it's cold. Um, I am taking a different approach. I've been door knocking. I have clients that are approved for a million dollars for a multifamily. We've been Boston, Brockton, Attleboro, Taunton, we have put in so many offers and we're still looking at this point. I am literally door knocking for this family. Like, hey, you had your house on the market once upon a time. I have somebody that is looking to buy. You you want to sell? Um, because it's just it's just that brutal out. And so if you know anybody that has a three family, but a minimum of three bedrooms, we're pre-approved for a million dollars as long as the rents make sense we're looking to buy. From there, your offer is accepted. Congratulations. I I think you should always do an inspection. If you have a family member that's a contractor, I tell you bring the family member with a contractor to the open house. So that way they can tell you everything that's wrong with the house and you can uh, make informed decisions. So that way you don't have to pay the additional five 550, 700, depending on the square footage of the house um, for uh, inspection. So is inspection important? Absolutely. Inspection on a brand new construction is still important because developers are trying to get in and get out and they sometimes do things a little too fast and overlook the issues. And so you want an inspector, you want a contractor, you want somebody with fresh eyes that has your best interest at heart, taking a look at the foundation, at the electrical system, at the heating system, at the roof, and making sure, even the windows, uh, and making sure that this is a place where it's going to keep you warm, the roof isn't going to cave in. The electrical is not going to start a fire because a lot of these older homes still have knob and tube. And so knob and tube is actually really like, I love seeing an old house with knob and tube because it was, it was so dangerous. And <laughs> we lived in danger our whole life when you think about it, like how many of us lived in a lead filled house with knob and tube? Like we were 
looking to die every day. <laughs> we were in danger. And so it's just, it's awesome to see uh, just how far we have come and the changes that have been made to zoning in order to keep us safe. And that's really at the end of the day, all an inspection is really for. There are ways for you to be strategic. If you go in, let's say, for instance, the house is 400000 you put an offer um, and all the houses around them have sold for like 390, 387. Go ahead and put an offer in for the the 390, the 393, have an inspection, come back and say, uh, this is about three thousand dollars worth of stuff I have to fix. You, I don't want you to fix it. I'll fix it. Don't worry about it. Just knock off this three thousand. Um, and so there's ways to negotiate during that period. A lot of times people are putting in offers uh without inspections and that's why it's important to get somebody on your team and have them come in while you're already looking so you know what the problems are you can put an offer in without inspection which kind of puts you at the top of the list um with a, a seller's agent because you know you're not going to come back nickel and diming me after inspection and you're more likely to like want to get to the closing table faster from there, after inspection, that's when it kind of feels like radio silence. It's really like quiet between you and your real estate agent. We used to talk every day. Now you hardly call me. It's because we we found what you're looking for. We're in there. We're locked in. You're going to have conversations with their attorney. You're going to have conversations with the loan officer. There's a whole bunch of documents and a whole lot of conversations that are going on behind the scenes making this deal happen. Once we get from inspection, we move into purchase and sales. That purchase and sales is the actual contract of you buying this house. The offer is like, hey, let me take you on this first date. The contract, which is the purchase and sales, is like, we're getting married. We are now engaged. And when I sign this paper, that is when we are we are locked in forever. Um, one of the things that I wanted to add going back to inspections, inspections are like what we wish dating would be. The inspector is going to tell you literally everything. So imagine sitting down and across the person's like, I bite my nails. I never put my clothes away. The toilet seat will never go down. I can't cook. I'm a mama's boy. And I don't have any dreams, goals, or ambitions for the future, but I have a really good job and I make 125 a year. And you're like, hmm, can I deal with this? Thank you. Thank you for all of that. Is this something that I want to walk into? And if you're like, well, you know, he's not abusive. I, I'm kind of happy he's a mama's boy. You know what? Let's move forward. That's what inspections are. They're going to tell you everything in the world that's wrong and you have to make a decision on whether or not you want to move forward. So if the roof needs to be replaced, it doesn't mean you can't buy the house. It just means, are you willing to pay the twenty twenty five thousand dollars it's going to take to replace the roof? If you use one of these construction loans, that maybe is not a problem for you. You still have thirty thousand dollars worth of wiggle room in your pre approval. You could just go ahead and do a two or three k simple. So it's just, I don't want you to to walk out of an inspection and feel like that 45 pages is overwhelming and oh my gosh there isn't a cgi in the kitchen i don't want this house because if you're gonna let a cgi um be the thing that scares you away can you even be a homeowner when the furnace goes out right because that CGI, that's a little $250 problem you get an electrician in there that knows what they're doing in and out same day so I, I just want you to be mindful of the things that you're going to be told when you have a inspection and whether or not that's your deal breaker. Um, after the purchase and sales agreement, going back and forth with Brian, getting all your documents in order, clarifying some questions that may come up. You want to be mindful that you have to have had your job for two years or be in the same field for at least two years, you have to have those two years of um, uh, a tax return. You're also in, on top of your tax return. You also need the W-2s attached to them. And so I've had clients that were just like, well, I have the tax return, but I don't have the W-2. You're going to have to go back and go get it because it's necessary. Uh, from there, 
Brian, I'll let you talk about the all the banking stuff that happens behind the scenes. Yeah, so um, you, you're right. I mean, it is it's intrusive, um, but most of that's kind of hopefully accomplished when you're doing the pre-approval. But um, you, you see a lot more now. There's that time lapse where you're pre-approved. You know, you might have uh, uh, we looked at everything, but it might be a, m a month, two months, a year before you find the home. So there'll be redundancy there where you're providing the same stuff, but just updated. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the the gist of it for most people is going to be your W-2s, you know, tax returns if you're self-employed or or if you have the side hustle. Um Pay, one month's pay stubs, two months bank statements, driver's license. And for most people, that's going to be the bulk of the documentation needed. Um, also going to uh, order an appraisal, which is for both of us, you know, for you to know that that the house is worth what you're you're paying for it. And also for the bank to know that it's worth what we're lending on. Um, appraisal is probably the, the most time consuming piece to all this. Um, between ordering and, and receiving it back, typically about two weeks. Um, during that two week period, um, that's when we're going to go through all the paperwork, make sure everything looks the same as what it did. Um, appraisal comes back, we go into underwriting, typically takes a day or two, come out of underwriting, and then we're kind of smooth sailing. So it's, it's like a I, I say to people, because we go through that same hiatus, right? You you get the 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 offer done and the inspection and then you disappear and then I take over for a couple of days, then I disappear. Um, because while you're waiting on the appraisal, there's really not much to do. Um, you know, that's just going through pa the the paperwork we have. Um and and honestly, that's a good process. Um, if there's if there's more to it than that. That's that's where you hear people complaining about like, oh, buying a house, such a pain in the ass. It That's probably because either the people they're working with in most cases or, you know, the the the, the individual has a difficult life. Um, sometimes that that's the case. Doesn't mean you can't get a loan, just means it might be more difficult than the person next to you. Yeah. Um, that's pretty much it. Yeah. And as as um, part of the, those difficulties, sometimes it could be child support. Sometimes yeah. it could be you getting a gift from a family member and they have to source or like prove where those funds came from. Um, and that can be, you know, a little uh, invasive for the person who's lending you this money because now they have to like open up their own bank account and say, hey, I didn't take this out of the mattress. You know, I didn't, this wasn't stolen. It, it's been in my account. I've had this money. I'm just lending it to this person for down payment, closing costs, whatever. You can use, if you have a 401k, you can tap into your 401k. Most of the time they require you to have a purchase and sales agreement because you can put in 16 different offers and that offer not get to the purchase and sale table. And so now, you know, you have this money from your 401k, but you're not in the process of actually purchasing. They usually have like, it depends. I want to be clear. It really depends on who your 401k is with. Um, I've seen it. They put an offer in and once the offer went through, they had access to their funds. I've seen it to where they could not get access to their funds until the purchase and sale agreement. I've seen it where they couldn't get access to their funds until they were in the like right there on the clear to close line. And so it really just depends on who your 401k is with. Um, I've and there's other like retirement accounts as well that you can tap into to purchase a house. Um, and so I won't speak on those because I am not familiar with them. But when we do the, the purchase and sales portion, that's also when your percentage comes in, whether your percentage is 1.5 because you're tapping into a grant or whether it is the full 3.5%, 5%. And we're at 5% right now. I'm really happy about that across the board. So we won't look see too many 20% right now, but I'm really excited about where we are in society. Not the interest rate, but just the... <laughs> yeah. um, 
And so from there, you get your clear to close. And then closing day is really exciting. Um, tip, I like to do day of walkthrough. And a walkthrough is just saying this house is in the same condition as when I put my offer in and I agreed to purchase this house. There have been times where colleagues did not do a walkthrough the day of closing and did the walkthrough 72 hours before closing. And then after they closed, came back, a washing machine was gone, the uh, refrigerator was gone, and it was gone because you signed on the paper that everything was cool and you were okay. You did the walkthrough 72 hours later. You gave people 72 hours of coming back into that house and take whatever it is that they wanted to take. That's not the case with everyone, but it can happen if you leave yourself open and vulnerable. And so I'm the type, let's go walk through the house, then go to closing. So that way I have secured... Um, funds, like we're going to do a hold back and that's just holding back money from the seller in order for them to get their shit together. Whether that shit is literally the shit that they left in the yard or the house, or it's like, I'm going to need for you to put that refrigerator back, whatever, or we're going to do a hold back. And since you took the refrigerator, not only, only am I going to penalize you for the, the, the cost of the refrigerator, but now you're taking away from my time, my energy, and I have to make a decision on what refrigerator I want. I want $2,500 for that. And so it really just depends if your agent is a beast, if your attorney is a beast, and what that looks like at the closing table. Because not all not all sellers are a-holes. Not everybody is trying to you know, take advantage of people but it does happen and you want to put yourself in the best position possible. And that's going to the walkthrough before you go to closing. And at closing, you will typically, right now, people are coming to the closing table with $0. Okay. I can't tell you how many people in the last year are coming to the closing table and don't have a check with them because the grants are covering closing costs, covered some of the down payment, covered buying down points so they have a lower interest rate. It's absolutely beautiful what I'm seeing as far as grants are concerned. And so I'm going to pass it over to Brian so he can discuss the grant for the Local 26. Um, Peter Ann, are you a Local 26er? I'm not, no. And Yahida, I know you're not Local 26, right? Okay, so since yeah. we don't have Local 26 here, maybe just um Dreams Grant and yep. the City Grant? Yeah. So um, th there's a few grants. And so I, I I guess I'll specify there's there's up to 50,000 in Boston. Now, so a lot of these are going to be income based um, and they go off again, kind of the county average median income. So um, just to give you an example in Boston to get um, and I guess maybe it's it's too complicated to really get into because it goes by family members. Like the more family members, the higher the income of the house you can make and still qualify for the grant. Um, and, uh, you know, just just for an example, let's see, do I have one here? I got it right here. Um, if you're a one person household and you make up to one hundred forty five thousand you can get 35 grand from the city. If you make less than 107,000, you can get 50 grand. And then those numbers keep going up as you have, if you have, you know, a child, two children, full five person family, the number keeps going up. And it, just for a reference, like a five person family can make up to 225,000 and still get a $35,000 grant. Um, it's free money. It's a no brainer. You can use it with any type of loan, whether you're doing conventional or FHA or a 203k or any of those, mm -hmm. um, you can do this grant. It's completely separate from everything. Um, so that's free money. Um, there's programs in Braintree, Quincy and Weymouth that'll give you up to 25,000. There's uh, you mentioned Lawrence. There's grants in Lawrence up to twenty five thousand. Brockton twenty thousand. There's grants everywhere. Um, 
pretty much anywhere you look to buy, there is likely a grant. The only usual catch to that, besides the local 26, because there's no, that's just a union giving you a grant and there's no income limit on that. Um, but any of the other grants are going to be based on the, in, the average income in that county. Mm -hmm. um, most counties anywhere around Boston are, are going to land at typically a, a, a single person, 140000 or less. Um, that's going to include Suffolk County, Plymouth, Middlesex, Norfolk, um, uh, Essex. Um, once you get out to like Worcester County, the numbers start coming down. Bristol County, same thing. The numbers come down um, because the average median income out there is is less. So um, I would say it gets a little complicated with who qualifies for how much with the the grants, but um, it's absolutely something that if if uh, you're interested, you know, um, reach out because uh, there's grants everywhere and it's free money. And so now you are finally home and you are the homeowner of 123 Purchase Lane. And then there's a whole nother problem. <laughs> there's whole other problems to deal with. But I want to make sure that neither one of you have any questions and there was nothing um, that we went over that you didn't fully understand or something that you want like clarity on or you heard something. Peter Ann? Um, well, I took Maha's class. Mm -hmm. I know it doesn't, but I just took it. Um, and I did the one plus Boston. I took that to that class. Okay, so I, just, I just took these classes just to have to say, like, I took them. I know, you know, yep. it's just a starting point. And um, how did we fare today? Did we fare equally with Maha? <laughs> better actually um and i just so i did a pre-approval probably two three years ago yeah um that was at 650 which okay then i did another one probably like a year ago and it was like three something and i'm like i make way much more money I'm just confused. Mm -hmm. So that was just like, okay, I left that alone. I just let it lapse. And I'm like, okay, I just was dragging my feet. But now it's like, I just got to get my life together. <laughs> yeah. I mean, part of, part of that's definitely going to be, you know, interest rates pay, play a lot into that. Um, you know, I mean, with, with interest rates, where they are now versus where they were, three years ago, it, it is night and day. Um, so it does hurt purchasing power. That being said, um, you know, the Fed just met today. They didn't raise rates again. Um, that's usually them signaling they're kind of done raising rates mm -hmm. and likely we're going to start seeing them go the other direction. Um, I don't know if we'll see it by the end of this year, but we'll definitely see it start happening next year. And then the purchasing power goes up from there. Um, that isn't to say, you know, to to hold off on anything, because as we're seeing in this market, you know, there's not a lot of supply. There's a ton of demand. Right. Which is pushing house prices up, um, especially in our area, anywhere greater Boston. There's nowhere that they're able to build these you know, huge neighborhoods or complexes like they do, you know, say in the Midwest or even some places down south, they have land. We don't. Um, so there's going to be a limited supply. And as rates go down next year, you're going to see even more demand, right? Because people that maybe couldn't get pre-approved before now with rates coming down, they're pre-approved. Um, other people who never bothered to get pre-approved are now going to want to get pre-approved because they see rates coming down. So typically, I would say to people, waiting costs money. House prices are going to continue to go up, at least in our area. There'll be pockets that that don't um, in the U.S., but um, around us, they're just going to keep going up. And 
So even if you bought something today at a higher rate, the beauty of it is you can always refinance that down the road when rates come down. But if you take a house today at 600 that is going to be worth 650 next year and you're able to buy it at 600 even if it's at today's rates, you're able to only owe that 600 and refi it to a lower rate later versus waiting and paying the higher price later. Was that pre-approval for a single family or for a multi? It was for a two family. Like, I don't want a one family. And mm -hmm. now I just feel like I don't even want to be in Boston at this point. I work in Boston and I'm over it now. Are you required to stay by the city? Like, do you work for the city? No. So mm -hmm. I work from here to Maine. <laughs> Truthfully. Oh, wow. So. so North Shore. North Shore might be a better bet since you work between Boston and Maine. So I was looking at, so now my thought process is I want land. Mm. Um, so I was like Avon, Stoughton, and Randolph, like the, that type of area mm -hmm. that I'm close enough to get to Boston fast enough because I'm on call 24 hours a day. So what do, what do you do? I clean up homicides and suicides is the oh, majority geez. of what I do. <laughs> I'm so intrigued. <laughs> and I'm always on mass and cast, unfortunately. Uh -huh. Dealing uh -huh. with that nonsense. But yeah, so I'm on call 24 hours a day. So yeah, so absolutely. Um, I would suggest taking a look at like Chelmsford, Lowell, um, Georgetown, Rowley. Even like Salisbury, Ainsbury, um, Plastow, um, New Hampshire, especially if you want like the feel of um, a Stoughton or um, what was the other one that you named? Randolph. Randolph. So if you're looking for that like towny feel that's still close to the city, like mm -hmm. Lawrence is not small like Lawrence is well established it has the Boston vibe everything that you would need um even Nashua uh Pelham in New Hampshire these are all towns that you could get you could you know could take your pre-approval higher but still have you close enough to like the city feel while also giving you land Pepper is pretty good too in Ayer, I don't know if it's Ayer or Ayer. Even even Lowell, um, Lowell is big and up and coming as well. And it does it does have a like um a Stoughton feel to it. Mm -hmm. So there are options. What about you, Yehada? You have questions. No, I'm just curious to see, like, learn more about if you're buying a second property, what would that look like? It looks a lot better today than it did a month and a half ago. So one of the, this is not my expertise, so I'll let Brian tell it. Oh, so are we speaking of a second home or an investment property? Possibly. No. Your she rental her, property. No, her second investment. home. She's talking about her second home. She's leaving this one and she needs to go find a second home for her family that had recently made changes. Okay. So um so you own a home now. You're looking to sell that. And yeah, I mean, that's 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 a good situation, I would assume. How long have you been in that home? Uh going on two years. Two years. All right. So you've you've definitely probably made some money there, right? Mm hmm Um Yeah, when we got it, we were already sitting on like almost ten thousand in equity because yeah. we got it at a decent price. So I mean, realistically, um, you know, the 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 catch with making an offer on something else and and um you know, we can, we can talk about this, but um, in my opinion, I still think it's better to have your house listed before mm -hmm. you, you, 
I don't want to say before you look, but I, you know, it's Murphy's law. If you, you go looking and you're not ready, you're going to find the perfect house. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, it's still, in my opinion, better for you to have your house listed first. Um, because you don't have to sell your home, right? You, you can put a contingency. If somebody comes in and gives you even more than what you asked for over asking whatnot, it doesn't lock you into selling. You, you know, this is still to a degree a seller's market. Okay. And um, you can put in the acceptance of the offer from somebody else, a buyer coming in and you're accepting the offer. You can put a contingency in there that is contingent on you finding suitable housing. Okay. Um, and that will give you time to go find that new house and also give you a little bit better leverage because you're going to be going up against maybe first time home buyers and, and, and people like that, that when you're looking to make an offer on a new home, you know, part of that isn't just the dollar amount that you offer them. It's also, are you ready to go? And if you if you have something to sell, but you can at least say to them, hey, I'm already under agreement. My house is sold as soon as, you know, I get an accepted offer on the, the, your house. That's going to make the seller feel like, OK, they're ready. If you go in and make an offer and you say, well, I still have to sell my house and they go, OK, well, what's going on with that? And you're like, well, I'm going to list it next week. They're going to say, well, how do we know you're going to be able to sell your house? How do we know how long it's going to take? Right. Um, so I'm still a big fan of put your house on the market first, get it under agreement and just put a clause in there that you like, you're not selling if you can't find a house. So you're kind of covered. Oh, I like that idea. Yeah. Any other question? No. Okay. I have kidnapped you for way too long. I thank you for your time. I appreciate you. Um, I'm here privately if you want to reach out and you have any additional questions. So is Brian. Um, I can email you because you registered for this. I can go ahead and email you and send you all my contact information, Brian's contact information. Um, or Brian, you can drop it in the chat, whatever's easiest for you. Yeah, yeah I'll put it um, in. And... I just want to make sure that you guys have everything you need to make informed decisions to do whatever is best for you, whether you make the move today, tomorrow, or five years from now. Um, and I'm kind of excited that today's session was better than Maha because <laughs> I do not have Maha money. <laughs> yeah, this was definitely good. It was, it felt more real. Genuine, yeah. Thank you, lovely. And you guys want to grab Ryan's information? Yeah, and, and just uh, feel free to reach out with any questions, literally anything. Um, it, it can't ever hurt to be overly prepared. So I have a quick question, because every six months we get a 5% raise. Yep. So my income's always going to change, but my check, I can work 80 hours one week and then 30 hours the next week. So my check never looks the same. So it's just like. So, all over the place. so typically what we do with someone who's got a lot of overtime or fluctuating income is, is you're typically going to be looking at a, two, they look at a two year average. So, um, do did you say sometimes you don't work 40 hours a week? Yeah, so I can work 60 or 80 hours a week and then the next week I can wake 30. So or, and, and has it been that way for a long time? That's just how the job is. I can't yep. predict, you know, when somebody dies or, you know, things yeah. like that. So that's just the job, the nature of the job. Cuz that would be amazing if you could. <laughs> <laughs> um so no, typically they they're going to use a two-year average. Okay. Um, they'll put a little bit more weight to the current. If it's if your income's going up, you know, mm -hmm. um, incrementally, you know, your hourly wage, 
they'll put mm -hmm. more weight on the the current income but typically it's about a two-year average is what they look at okay yeah all right mm -hmm. well i just want to make sure you have brian's information right yes okay so yeah, I, I, with anything. I just want to be mindful of like your personal finances if you want to discuss more with him privately um, that mm -hmm. you have his information and, and can get a better understanding of what that looks like for you. Okay. But I am so intrigued about like oh, <laughs> my <laughs> job. It, so that's like the coroner's office, right? No. So we go in after. So even like the thing in Maine, our, our company went to go clean that up. Oh, wow. So it's basically the after. So everything, like all the shootings in Boston, I probably do like 95% of the cleanup for it because I'm the Boston person. Oh, so you mean like the actual like blood? Yes. Oh. Um, Somebody dies in their house or, and they've been left there for however long. We go in there clean it up, make it like it never happened. But yeah. You will never run out of business. No. <laughs> never, ever. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You for so. sharing. No. <laughs> you don't scare easily. I'll take it like you don't nothing scare you. Huh? No. <laughs> no. I'm no. scared thinking about the things that you've seen. I'm good. <laughs> I've seen a lot. People blow themselves up. I've seen a lot. Mm. So. All right. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate you. Absolutely. <laughs> if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate. Nothing's a stupid question. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brian, this is, um, I already have text messages and emails of like, sorry, my kid, my husband, I couldn't, my job. So, um, this happens. call was recorded for quality assurance, so I'm going to share it. Um, okay. <laughs> so don't be surprised if um, those that weren't here tonight still reach out. All right. Awesome. All right, then. Have a good night. All right, ladies. Have a good night. Good night.